Actually, so for, first an apology, because there's many folks in this room, especially new young businesses, that are all running on top of the Amazon Web Services, and I'm not going to mention you today. Yeah, this, it's pretty hard because so much stuff happens on top of uh, the Amazon Cloud these days um, that is extremely exciting. Uh, and so today, I, I just want to try and give a bit of an overview about how we, especially in the web services business, look at um, the kind of data processing that is going on and the kind of innovation that I think also we at Amazon needs to do to make sure that we can serve those who are interested in really um, in managing and in storing and in processing data much better. Uh, so, so most of my examples actually come out of the e-commerce space, most, mainly because I think that speaks to most people's uh, um, imagination, but there's a lot of other stuff happening. You know, whether it is um, oil or pharma, um, lots of things in, uh, in sky stuff, and many, many, many new data sets are being created also by the government, um, and publicly available for everyone to use and to mash up against. So there's lots of cool stuff happening. First, actually, I wish this one would work. Yes. Uh, actually, first of all, uh, yeah, I work for a bookshop, uh, so I have to recommend you a book to read. This book... Uh, it's called The Fourth Paradigm. It's a book uh, collected by the guys from Microsoft Research uh, as a, a tribute to Jim Gray. And Jim, um, a famous researcher uh, in data and databases, had many of the ideas that are actually um, the foundation for how we now talk about building very large uh, data systems, how to analyze them, and the impact on society, as well as he had a lot of great ideas about how to share them. Um, they are all put down in that book, and uh, I recommend you to read it. The Kindle version costs you 99 cents. Yeah. And so if you, uh, if you want a short link, just note this one down and you, uh, you get taken to that particular page. Uh, another thing I want to do and start before I forget it, I want to make a push uh, for uh, telling you about the uh, education program of the Amazon Web Services. If you either want to use cloud computing in your classroom, if you want to use it in your data research or in any research that you're doing, or if you are a student, and it doesn't necessarily need to be um, an, um, is it, a university student, you can be a high school student, and you have a great idea for a project for which you need massive storage and massive computation to run, you know, go to that link, submit your product proposal, and uh, the likelihood that you get funded for that is actually pretty high. So, um, so I'm an infrastructure guy. For me, big data is this, yeah? that actually most of the pieces around how you collect, how you store, how you manage it, how you process it, that all of those things don't count anymore. Yeah, but that's really a bottom-up. That's an engineering view of what, uh, of what big data, for me at least, means. Uh, in reality, for most businesses, this is what big data means. Yeah? That they feel that in their data, there is a competitive advantage. Yeah, that if only they could be processing all the data that they would have or where they feel that they're sitting on top of, yeah, that that is actually something um, that would, could give them a competitive advantage. And with the idea that actually bigger is better. And at Amazon, given that we've kind of um, you know, pioneered, especially some of the uh, recommendation things, we know that bigger is better, because the more data you can collect, the more finer grained often you can do your analysis, and you, um, you can avoid things like this, yeah? where uh, just your recommendation for a, uh, a duck is actually six other ducks. Yeah? And, and actually, there's, there's a whole range. Just type into Google, funny Amazon recommendations. Most of those are actually from our adult goods category, and especially if the sales, the number of sales in that particular, for that particular product isn't that high, you will find very surprising recommendations. Yeah? They, the, that's all driven by the fact that there isn't enough data, actually, to make a really solid recommendation. But most of this, and also because so things bigger or better, there's one, actually one caveat on the bigger or better. There are a number of categories of data where the quality of data is actually much more important than uh, the amount of data that you have. And we'll get later to what particular category that is actually about. Now, 
Given that things that are bigger and better, I like to believe something else that sets the new style of data analysis aside from, from traditional business intelligence, especially if you look at it from an infrastructure point of view, in the old days, on forehand, you knew what kind of questions you wanted to ask. And the questions that you wanted to ask actually drove the data model. And the data model drove how you were going to store it, and the data model also drove almost how you were going to collect that particular data. Most of the things that are happening now around data analysis is actually, and especially with collecting as much data as possible, is that there's a bottom-up thing. Yeah? You collect as much data as possible without that you on forehand already know which questions you're going to ask. And more importantly, you don't know which algorithms you're going to run. And you don't know how you are going to refine those algorithms. And for all of that, with all that uncertainty, how much data, how much processing power, it means that you don't actually really know how much resources you need to support the kind of business intelligence or the kind of analysis that you want to do. And so this uncertainty around resource usage drives a sort of very close marriage between big data analysis and cloud computing. Yeah, so because mainly I think this is that if you're really serious about new style of data analysis, you should not be worried about data storage. You should not be worried about the amount of computation that you can do. You should be able to be completely free of those constraints. And that's actually the kind of things that we try to pursue uh, with you know, the Amazon Web Services, which is um, some of the pioneer uh, pieces of cloud computing in helping big data scientists to become successful. So I believe, from my point of view, this is the pipeline for most analysis, yeah, or for most big data analysis. Yeah, there's a collection phase, there's, uh, or maybe they're just challenge areas or opportunity areas, or what are the things that you would like to do while sitting in your underwear. Yeah? So collect, store, organize, analyze, and share. I think those are the overall pieces of the process of analysis, and each of them, from an infrastructure point of view, need to be solved in a different way, or deserve attention, how it should get done. Yeah, so let's start off with collect. And there's many, if you look at our customers, how they're actually using, and how they're moving data into the cloud, there's, there's a whole variety. But in general, what makes them different is the timeline on which data arrives. There are some customers who are real-time streaming their data into their systems, and at the same time actually real-time reading and analyzing. They're basically streaming and appending data into it. Others may take other different timelines. Uh, you know, they'll move their log files from their uh, e-commerce site on an hourly basis into Amazon. And then there's others that will just have such large data sets that are only making sense if the complete data set actually arrives um, in our environment. Uh, for an example there is the, uh, for example, the US census data. It doesn't make sense to deliver half that data. The data needs to be there, all or nothing. Yeah, and for example, this is an, uh, you know, there's still speed of light, and there's still network latencies and things like that. This is actually the Oceanographic Observatory Initiative, uh, University of San Diego, University of Washington, uh, working together in many different places around the world, putting sensors into the ocean. And those sensors will be live streaming data continuously about movement of the ocean and things like that, and they stream it directly into Amazon S3. Yeah? There's no longer intermediary stations or things like that. To do that, we made a, um, a collaboration with, uh, with Scenic as well as the uh, Pacific Northwest Gigapop such that the whole California research network, which is a 10 gigabit network, actually ends directly into the Amazon storage systems, into, into the, uh, the Amazon EC2 environment. So there is a direct link of 10 gigabit from each academic institution, or actually also each K-12 institution in California into the cloud. 
But of course, you know, not, not, it's not suitable for everything. Yeah? Some things can easily be streamed. Uh, some things are just too big to be streamed. And for that, the, you shouldn't underestimate the bandwidth of a FedEx box. Yeah? This is actually uh, Amazon Import Export is a service that we've set up so that you can actually FedEx your data into Amazon. Yeah? You create disks, you put your data on those disks, and you know, in these is you have easily visit hundreds of terabytes or petabytes of, uh, of uh, data. This is the preferred way of actually getting that data to us. It's fast and it's high bandwidth. Store is actually, I think, um, how to store that data once you've collected, how you move it into uh, to environment. This is actually the biggest challenge that companies have, um, whether they're doing the, 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 the big data or the data analysis themselves, or whether they have intermediary parties do it for them. Um, this is in general when people start to consider to use cloud, because they are realizing that the bigger the data set grows, the more important they need to become as data storage experts. Yeah, and you'll find many, many actually uh, companies that have moved to the cloud, not necessarily immediately for cost reasons, but because actually storing all this data yourself is a nightmare. And especially if it's growing. Razorfish is a, uh, is a company in, uh, that actually does a lot of clickstream analysis for their customers. And they are actually processing terabytes and terabytes of data a day. And they, were, they had a pretty good predictive model of how things would grow. And they thought they were ahead with that in terms of ordering their network attached storage to store all that data on. And then in 2009, it turned out that the holiday season for, for e-commerce companies, many of them who they serve, is going to be, is going to be much more successful than anticipated. And at that moment, they basically need to, you know, start driving trucks to fries to start buying more disks, so just such that they can continue to support their customers. And they couldn't sign up more customers because they were just maxed out on their storage. Yeah, so your business should not be, in any sense, constrained by the amount of hardware you can buy. Those are the old days. New days is the data and your storage should be unconstrained. So organize, many pieces I think are, are around organize. Uh, not only you know, how do you manage data, how do you get them together, but this is also a phase where quality is really important. Yeah, uh, one of the tools actually that we use at, uh, at Amazon is to use Amazon Mechanical Turk. And I don't know if you know that, that's, there's just a number of tasks where humans are much better for equipped than, um, than that computers are. And so there's a whole range of these tasks where we've set up a system where you can insert work into the system as if it is a computer program. And then in the middle, there's a few hundred thousand workers that pick up this work and actually do this work for you. And you can do very, very great things with it. So one of them is to control data. That's an area where, uh, for example, if you have user-generated data, here you can put some control on actually what, what arrives in your data set and what not. Yeah, you can correct it. Sometimes, or quite often, especially when you merge data sets, there is a lot of mess in it. It's really dirty data. Yeah, and workers are really good in actually making these judgment calls. Or validate data. Is this really true? Is this really a dress, or is it just... Or is it a, a, a pair of jeans? Yeah, those things actually happen a lot, especially in Amazon. If you see merging of catalogs, it's a nightmare. And it's easy to enrich data. If people can look at products or can look at information, raw information, they can actually look at that and start making uh, metadata enrichments of that data. So this is, uh, this is an example of a... Uh, uh, a very large provider of business listings. They have about 20 million listings, and they take in about a million pieces of new information a day. Quite a bit of that is either it's new data or it is uh, data that may be duplicates. And so they have a whole process around it in using mechanical Turk and using humans to make their judgment call about whether this is actually a new data item or not. Now, in analysis, there's an analysis, there's a lot of you guys in the room that actually are in this business. I'll skip this 
this slide as quickly as possible because it's probably an insult to many of the other companies that are also doing analysis. You guys know who you are. Um, for many of those companies that are actually in the analysis phase, we provide easy tools um, at, at Amazon, especially if in the working on Hadoop. Uh, the idea is really that it's still pretty hard to run Hadoop jobs. And with Elastic MapReduce, our goal was to make it easy for everybody else to start up you know, clusters with hundreds of nodes and process hundreds of terabytes with, with, li with little effort. Yeah? And also a tight integration with the other services. As well as that, we would make sure that you would have the latest version of Hadoop fully tested for cloud on this platform available. Yeah, again, there's a, there's a whole race. Razorfish is a good example. They are big users of uh, Elastic MapReduce. They do uh, lots of contextual ads based on continuous uh, analysis of data that their customers send to them, and they're really successful with that. Um, Netflix, uh, it's been named before. Um, I urge you to take a look at Adrian Cockcroft's presentation on the current data in the cloud really a hands-on presentation on how you can use all these different tools to, to uh, actually go through massive data sets about customers as well as other, uh, as other types. Yeah, and they, most of our customers don't do it for just one thing. They'll have 20 or 30 different analysis going on. Uh, Etsy and Yelp probably are in your toolbox of very favorite uh, sites, both of them big users of Elastic MapReduce. So Yelp, for, I think they run about 200 MapReduce jobs a day, processing about three, three or four terabytes of data. But it's not only the Hadoop world, of course. Eh? I mean, it's also, also big companies like SAP use all of their analytics skill. This is a great website, um, uh, Carbon Impact website from SAP, where you can feed your ERP data into this website where they then do the analysis and actually uh, evaluate for you what the carbon impact of all your processes is. Um, also runs on, uh, on cloud, of course, because all of this stuff needs to be able to grow and shrink as much as you like. Yeah, we're almost finished here. Sharing is still a very important part, I think, of all of this processing. In the past, much of our sharing actually were, was data sets themselves. Yeah, you would do a massive analysis, and then that would result in a data set. But often those data, and those data sets would then be visualized. But these days, the resulting data sets are almost as large as the original data sets. So you see a whole new area of new visualizations and new types of actually um, sharing happening. Yeah, uh, a good example there is uh, the NASDAQ, uh, just because they wanted to uh, build a market replay app, started, had started to store all the data that they were collecting from the market into Amazon S3. Yeah, and now they've actually taken the next step, understanding that, yes, many people like this app, but there could be so much more usage of this data. So they are now putting an API on top of that data and make that data available for everyone to use. So if you want to build applications on top of market replay data, go to data.nasdaq.com. Yeah, uh, more public data sets available as well. Go and have a look at that. But most importantly, for all of this infrastructure stuff, this is still day one. And we really depend, in terms of cloud, on you guys to feed back to us what are the kind of things that cloud doesn't do well at this moment for you and that we, we should be doing different such that we can serve you better and that we can give data in the hands of everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much.